Hey there, my name is Portia Laurie. Welcome to or welcome back to my YouTube channel. In today's video, we're going to be discussing kind of a wrap up of what I've learned from watching this season of rom-coms from my What Did We Learn series. If this is your first video, you don't have to have watched everything I've done up until this point to understand what's going on. But of course, you know, I'd love it if you want to check it out. So I'll have a playlist ready of everything I've covered for season one of What Did We Learn? And um, I'll have that linked in the description as well. So in this season of What Did We Learn? I really wanted to focus on rom-coms. It's one of my favorite movie genres and it was just kind of fun to do a deep dive on different movies, some newer, some older, um, but all like generally rom-coms I very much enjoy. So I thought a way to kind of wrap up the season would be to discuss what makes a good rom-com. That's kind of what we're going to be discussing in today's video. But before I get into that, as always, if you enjoy my opinion on movies, TV shows, music, be sure to do me a solid to drop a like on this video, then run over to that subscribe button and hit the bell next to it so you can be notified every time I upload. And side note, if you really can't get enough of my opinion, you can head over to the Cinema Sit Down podcast, a podcast I co-host with my boyfriend and his best friend, and we just sit around, we talk about movies, and it's a lot of fun, and we'd love if you joined us. The Cinema Sit Down podcast, it'll be linked in the description box below. So the first step we gotta cover is what is a rom-com? A rom-com is basically like a slice of life, typically fictionalized tale of a romantic relationship. And the plot is usually centered around like a will they, won't they type of situation. Now let's get into a little bit of the history of romantic comedies and the general structure of them. So we first actually have to look at the original Greek mythology. This is where we see the catalyst of story building and world building. And we're also seeing in Greek plays where they are centered around a more romantic or sensual nature. There is one play I read about and it was called, okay, forgive me because I'm totally gonna butcher the pronunciation, uh, Lysistra, Lysistrata? Fingers crossed, we'll see. Play about where a bunch of women um, are all wives to these kings and they have a giant war going. And in order to help stop the war, one of the women bands together all of them to stop giving um, favors to their husbands as a way of like strike and negotiations for ending the war. And I thought that that was like, that's pretty revolutionary. We can't talk about rom-coms without talking about Billy Shakespeare. And so of course, William Shakespeare is known for kind of contemporizing the general structure of how most rom-coms are made even to this day. We have movies like 10 Things I Hate About You, which is a modernization of Taming of the Shrew. And if we want to go even further than that, I have not seen it yet, but of course everyone has not stopped talking about it. But the new Sydney Sweeney Glenn Powell movie, Anyone But You, is also a modernized version of Too Much Ado About Nothing. So as we can see, the, the influence of William Shakespeare lives on well past his prime. Now, moving into the 20th century, we see that with the invention of sound, we saw a revolution in movies. The 1934 film, It Happened One Night, is considered to be a pivotal rom-com that changed the trajectory of the genre and films for that era. Through the 30s and 40s, we do see that there is a rise of what they call screwball comedies that became a big audience favorite. So screwball comedies are kind of just like silly situations, you know, it's the Three Stooges type of stuff. And now that rom-coms were considered a profitable market, these screwball comedies often then woven in romantic side stories or beeline stories for the main character. And that would be another way to draw audiences in. Something that's important to note through the 30s and 40s is that at this time, film studios were required to abide by something known as the Hayes Code. And the Hayes Code basically was a very restrictive guideline that dictated what films were and were not allowed to display to audiences. This included things such as profanity, nudity, realistic scenes of violence, and any kind of flirtatious notions. 
I think that was a very YouTube way to put that. <laughs> now the Hayes Code actually went on until 1968, so there's still a lot of movies that had to abide by these guidelines. It's a pretty wild thing. Let me know in the comments if you guys would be interested in a breakdown of the Hayes Code and kind of how it came to be and then how it was ultimately gotten rid of. Now as we move into the 50s to 70s, there is quite a change in pop culture. There's quite a change in the world at this time. And we do see more films really pushing the boundaries of what they could get away with. And in terms of when it comes to rom-coms in that genre, we definitely see them pushing the boundaries as far as how much flirtation, how much kind of innuendo they could get away with. And maybe a little bit of steam without necessarily crossing lines. Not to say that a lot of these films didn't come with their own set of controversies due to these reasons. I also think this would be a fair time to say this is where we see the rise of like the bombshell leading lady characterization. Yes, this is the era of the, the pinup girl as well. So we're just seeing so much more emphasis being put on the beautiful female leads than we had previously to this. I would say movies were extremely male driven. And this is where they're starting to see that casting women will draw more women to theaters, thus money, you know, how, how, how everything works. Now through the 70s, there was um, somewhat of a decline through the rom-com genre and it wasn't as popular or as profitable as it had been pre in previous years. I personally think this is due to the rise in like edgier movies with the abolishment of the Hayes Code by the 70s, I mean, filmmakers really had way more control over what they could put out there. And this is when we saw a rise in horror. You know, I've talked about it quite a few times on my channel, but the golden age of horror is considered to be the 70s. So it would make sense that there might be a bit of a drop off from the rom-com genre. Now, I don't want to give much praise or acknowledgement, but in everything I read, this is uh, continuously coming up. So I guess we kind of have to talk about it, but we're not gonna talk about it for long. But in 1977, we saw a revitalization to the rom-com genre, and that was due to a little film called Annie Hall, written by known PDF file Woody Allen. So that's why I don't really wanna talk about it. Anyway, let's move on. So now we jump into, of course, my favorite era of the rom-coms, the 80s and the 90s. This is when rom-coms became not grittier or edgier, I would say, but they started to feel a little bit more realistic. We were starting to make fun of some of the more idealized and ridiculous notions of uh, decades past. You know, we were moving forward as a society, so we were being more progressive and a lot of the viewpoints that we shared back then were no longer applicable. And so films really took all of that information and began to make it into jokes within the same kind of formula. So, you know, very, very meta at this point. Also seen during this time is that we're getting a lot more characters with depth. There's just a lot more to them. They have different layers. It's not necessarily so black and white. There's a lot more room for the audience to find these characters relatable and thus having a more personable experience with these movies. Rom-coms remained a relative staple of you know, the film going experience. And we would see kind of a rise during the early 2000s in kind of the amount of rom-coms dominating the box office, but then would also see a sharp decline. And I think this is most likely due to audience fatigue, once again, where they were just getting inundated with all of these stories and it was like time for something else, something new or different. And I think that's why in my personal opinion, movies and TV shows have taken more of a dramatic and darker turn in general. And just, I, I, I truly feel like the landscape is generally more sad than it is happy. So therefore, rom-coms 
don't really do well in that kind of market. However, I think that's changing in 2024. We can come back to this later. But the early 2000s do have some outliers, you know. For every Gili, you know, there was a Made in Manhattan or a we The Wedding Planner or any other J-Lo movie of this. Why was she in so many rom- She was in so many rom-coms. She is the rom-com queen, I think. You know who's the rom-com king? It's Adam Sandler. It's absolutely Adam Sandler. Put J-Lo and Adam Sandler in a movie. Have they done one yet together? They should. Now moving into the modern era of rom-coms, I feel that the rom-coms that are coming out as of late are a lot more in depth. I think they're a lot more interesting. I think the characters have a lot more to offer and so it makes for a better viewing experience. And we're seeing a more diverse cast, a more diverse uh, female male leads. I talked about this a little bit in my To All the Boys I've Loved Before video. We're also seeing characters that are dealing with different types of mental health issues. It's great that there's like an inclusivity. Also we're starting to see less just heteronormative couplings and we're starting to see you know love across all of the spectrums and that's a really beautiful thing to see. So now that we've gotten through the history of rom-coms let's talk a little bit more about how these movies are generally put together. First we need to have some kind of ploy, some kind of reason. Um, the thing about rom-coms is that it's not only a romantic centered movie there's also got to be an element of comedy and usually the plot is something a little bit semi ridiculous or over the top to add to the natural comedy of the movie so these are some of the most popular ploys that I've seen across every movie I mean feel free to make lists in the comments of your favorites of these different ploys so of course we have enemies to lovers, and if you're unfamiliar with that premise, enemies to lovers is usually a set of people who have had some type of history and they do not like each other, and then are set into some type of situation that forces them to spend an obnoxious amount of time together and thus leaving room for love to come into the picture. Now, along with enemies to lovers, it needs to be mentioned, there's also BFFs to lovers. Usually one half of the friendship is in love with the other half and the other half either it does not know or doesn't want to ruin the relationship. Something happens where an extensive amount of time is spent together. You get the idea. These two plots are really interchangeable. Now, of course, we got to get into fake dating, which we covered a lot in my To All the Boys I've Loved Before video. But this is basically when we have a situation where one or both characters need each other for some type of reason. It never makes much sense. But they need a date or they need a girlfriend for the holidays and they pretend to begin to be a couple. Now, one of my favorites that I feel like is like underutilized and they utilize this more in like action movies with like subplots, sub romantic plots, but I do love the pretending to be somebody else. So um, first thing that comes to mind is like the princess switch, you know, where they're just happen to look alike and they switch places and then fall in love. Uh, but then the other person doesn't know that they're falling in love with somebody else and it's, you get it. I personally, big fan. I don't know why. I just, I, I like that ploy. I feel like it works for me most of the time. Lastly, I have love triangles. Now I personally am extremely burnt out on this ploy because so much, so many of the teen films of my teendom, my youth, you don't just use the crap out of this. I also remember love triangles being so big on TV. So like this was like Ugly Betty, I remember had like a love triangle element, I'm pretty sure. Uh, Gossip Girl was based on that as well with the book series. Um, Vampire Diaries, obviously. So this is really seen just like across the genre. And if we could just like, if we could take out any of these ploys and like, never use them ever again. I think my, I think the love triangle is the one that does it for me. I just can't. Now another attribute that is extremely important to the rom-com genre is the meet cute. Now I value a rom-com based on the meet cute quite a bit. 
and usually if I don't like it, I may, I, I, it really, it changes how the trajectory of the movie is gonna go for me. Is that dumb? Absolutely. Do I still do it anyway? Absolutely. So of course there are a ton of different ways to do the meet cute, but here are the most popular. The first one is the physical introduction. So what I mean by that is like, when they collide for whatever reason, when things fall, when, you know, there's a, there's a physical collision that forces these two characters to meet each other. I'm not a huge fan of the physical one just because it's always like kind of silly and it's like Whoa. wacky stuff where they're like running in opposite directions and they collide. I don't need to see that anymore. I don't think any of us need to see that anymore. So if it's done well, or if it's done creatively, hey, I'm kind of here for that. Go along with the ploy I mentioned earlier, there's the mistaken identity. So someone sees the other person, they mistake them for this person, and the other person just goes along with it, and this snowballs out of control. And lastly, there's the reconnection me cute. I think this is the most boring, but this is where we're usually seeing characters who used to know each other, used to date, used to be friends, used to go to the same high school, used to be neighbors, whatever the case may be, they reconnect for whatever reason and thus love grows. Now, a sideline that I have mentioned numerous times, I think, throughout the video, but we cannot have a proper rom-com without having a proper best friend character. Some of the ways that this is displayed in rom-coms would be the funny but highly inappropriate friend. Okay, we all know this one, right? Do you think that this character often falls into a third version of this trope? They're after, um, they're after getting, why did I make that motion? They're after, you know, getting getting at it. That tends to be another asset of their personality, again, i.e. Stifler. Now, what I see is most popular with feminine best friend characters and also uh, black or ethnic best friend characters. We have the wise friend, and this friend just gives sage advice. I don't know why this is lumped in so much with ethnic best friend characters, but I do think that there's enough evidence to show that this is very popular with that particular type of casting. Now we can't have a rom-com without a third act twist. It's so necessary for these types of films to work. Like I really can't think of any good rom-com that doesn't feature this particular ploy. I think that it is really specific to rom-coms and yes, it may happen in other films, but I feel like it's very specific to rom-coms. So one of the third act twists that I don't necessarily love, but it's the huge revelation. This is the exposure of someone who's said a lot of lies or a big lie, you know, the, this is where the lying about their identity usually comes forward. And of course you need this to happen in order for like, the romance to actually feel real by the end of the film. It's just so weird that they always wait till the third act to get to there. Whereas like you could break this kind of news to them at any point in time, but it always seems to be the last third of the film. We can also see the misunderstanding, which I think is probably the more like lazy third act twist. And this is usually where like, there's a confusion in a conversation or like a text gets missed or like someone can't show up to something and therefore the other person gets obnoxiously mad and like ends things. And the final third act twist that I can think of is kind of edging on more of a dramatic shift if it's a more dramatic rom-com. But this is when someone kind of relapses into old behavior that maybe they had let go be due to their finding their soulmate and getting into this relationship that they then fall back into and the main the other character doesn't know if they can be trusted now we can't end any good rom-com without the grand gesture i feel like that is such a staple of the genre and probably a big reason as to why people enjoy them so much because it's this is a, a lot of wish fulfillment for uh, many people, myself included as someone who considers themselves somewhat of a hopeless romantic. Great examples of grand gestures. We have the infamous like airport 
train, station, bus stop, like whatever, you know the scenario. Like it's the big dramatic reveal that they're going to be together in some capacity. Bonus points if there's any kind of security chase or someone has to jump a barricade in order to be with this person and have this big grand showing of love. And lastly, I think the one that is done the absolute most is usually in front of friends, family, co-workers, a big giant group of people that get to hear someone declare their love for the main character or vice versa. These ones I do think are really expected, so the more creative you can get with them, the better for your film. And I love a big grand gesture. I don't care how cliche it sounds. Like, I love the big de declaration of love. I love if there's a big kiss at the end of it. Bonus points, uh, pops their, their foot while they're kissing. It's just, I love it. Classic. So now we have to ask the penultimate question. What in fact does make a good rock pop? One element most definitely has to be the chemistry and I don't think that good chemistry ends at just the love interest characters. This has to be fluid throughout the entire cast. Quotable lines and memorable moments are also another reason that rom-coms stay in the audience's consciousness. And lastly, I think the thing that really draws audiences in is there is a wish fulfillment factor into these movies feel this sense of like yeah that's you know if everything was perfect like that's how it would look that's how it would be so that is what i learned from my season of watching love or rom-com movies uh tell me what you guys learned in the comments down below if you want to leave a list of my personal favorite rom-coms i will have them listed here on screen somewhere and probably in the description if you're curious to go check out some of my favorites. Be sure to drop into the comments and tell me what's your favorite rom-com, what was the favorite rom-com I covered this past season on my channel, and, and tell me what you're looking forward to for next season which will be all about femme fatales. And the first film I'm going to be covering is Swim Fan. Make sure to drop into the comments and tell me what other films I should cover for that particular genre. If you enjoyed this video, as always, do me a solid and drop a like on it. It helps me so much to know that you guys are enjoying this series. I am certainly enjoying making it. Reminder, I do have a podcast. It's called The Cinema Sit Down Podcast. If you want to check it out, it's available on iTunes and Spotify and probably other places you get podcasts. It'll be linked in the description box below. But I think that's going to do it for me today. So until next time, I'll catch you guys later. Bye.